he gives you just like a couple paragraphs and then a, then a line break, a couple paragraphs and then a line break, a couple paragraphs and a line break. Um, and, and I read about this and he said, um, essentially mosaics made up of a whole bunch of tiny little chips and each chip is a joke. And that's the way he writes his books. And I think joke he's saying very broadly here because it feels like these little moments, he's just giving you little pieces and each little piece has a little beginning, middle and end. It leads to some sort of punchline and whether that punchline is funny or, or darkly ironic or, or kind of sad or just powerful. There are these little moments and, and it's broken up and in, because of that, it's so easy to read. Welcome, friends, to episode 189 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss Kurt Vonnegut's 1969 novel, Slaughterhouse Five. Welcome back, James. It's been a few weeks since we've talked, really, and uh, it's definitely since we've done this. And I uh, feel a little bit rusty, but uh, I'm so excited to get back into it. Uh, and, you know, hopefully everything's working, the mics are on, hopefully everybody can hear us okay. <laughs> yeah, I felt a little bit of butterflies. I was like, what is this new sensation that I haven't <laughs> felt in weeks? It's amazing how, how quickly the rust sets in, just a few weeks yeah. off. Yeah, Yeah, but I'm excited to talk about this story. Uh, this was a, This is a scenario where, like, as I was reading the book, I really wanted to text you to talk about some stuff. So we got a lot to talk about here. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I have so much. Uh, I won't be able to, to talk about everything. Kurt Vonnegut is an incredibly interesting man. And I was watching interviews. I, you know, I was I was reading just tons of stuff about him. He's an instructor. He taught at the Iowa workshop for a while. He went around into different lectures. Several of them are pretty famous in writing circles. Um, so there's a lot of talk to talk about, like craft and theory um, that goes into his writing. Um and I'm sure we won't be able to get into a lot of that, but it, we'll see. If, if things come up, I'll try and touch on it. But yeah, I mean, we're going to focus on Slaughterhouse-Five, which is his most well-known novel. Uh, I think it's his best-selling novel, so I think this is a good place to start. Um, I am a big fan of his. I, I felt like my love of his writing was rekindled in reading this book. It had been a while since I'd read anything by him. Um, I, I have read, I think, like four or five other novels of his, and uh, we can talk about how this very like this book is kind of an outlier in some ways, but in other ways it is, is very of a kind with a lot mm -hmm. of his books. Um, there's there's just so much I, I want to talk about with it. But before we get into too much of my sort of loaded opinions, just uh, where where are you at with this book? We're going to keep things spoiler free for a minute here mm -hmm. uh, at the start. We'll let you know when, when we're going to get into spoilers. But for people who haven't read any Vonnegut, maybe, like you. Um, right. What was your first impression of this author? Like, how did you feel reading it? Did you like it? Yeah, I had high expectations. And uh, because I just heard a lot about Kurt Vonnegut and I heard a lot about Slaughterhouse-Five in general, not plot stuff, but just like sort of how important it is. And um, I was blown away. I think it was like, it completely was not what I was expecting in a good way. And I thought that it was going to be a very self-serious and it is now there is very self there are very serious elements to the story while also sort of being like this darker comedic ironic take on on some of the stuff that you know basically happened what i don't think that's a spoiler to say like uh some of the stuff that you could have potentially happened or in, in some kind of scenario you're talking but, about uh, um the the book centers on a lot of events in the second world war um which uh, are mostly true. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, well, the, so, the book begins, yeah. like, uh, all of this is true or something like that to a point. Or... Well, 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 I'll give you the exact quote. The book begins, all of this happened more or less. The war parts, is. anyway, are pretty much true. So th this is, like, one of the most famous novel openings of all time. Uh, I read a thing that said that it, there was a list put out by, I think, the American Book Critics Society, uh, top 100 opening lines of all time. This ranked 38th on that list. Mm -hmm. um, so the Luke Bang and book beginnings, <laughs> if, if <laughs> we're going to call it that, um, this should definitely rate uh, highly on there. Um, yeah. One of the things that makes it so good is that it, uh, that sort of 
I love that it comes in and it sort of uh, asserts something with confidence and then immediately undercuts it with with doubt. And that right. uh, that is a perfect summation of the th- sort of the thematic weight of this novel. Yeah. And the narrator throughout. And yeah. uh, but just to get to like my expectations going into it, I I thought that it was going to be really self-serious and really like a uh, literary dramatic story. And mm. I didn't know what to expect. I, I haven't read any of his stuff. Yeah, I've just you don't kind know of the heard style. how important. And and I was completely taken with this. This is like I've talked in, on the podcast a few times about things that sort of speak to my sensibilities. And this has a lot of like some of the humor, some of the like, just like just going wild with a story in ways that you could have never expected and having such a unique story in this in this specific scenario. I was just I was taken on a journey and I, I'm not afraid to say that at, when I closed this book, I was like, that's one of my favorite books I've ever read. I it love absolutely it, is right away. I knew. I love to hear that. This is this is, you know, in my Mount Rushmore of books, I think. Uh, I, I do believe it's my favorite Vonnegut novel. Um, Breakfast of Champions would give it a run for its money. I also love Sirens of Titan. I think that was the first book I read by him, so I want to reread it and see how it stacks up now that I've read other things. Um, he's got a lot of great, great works. Um, but yeah, this one, I think this is, I think this is the cream of the crop. Um, yeah, I'd have to, I kind of have to reread them all to really tell you. Cat's Cradle is also great. So um, people, people, I'm sure all have, all have their favorites for different reasons. Yeah, I'm interested in reading all of them. And something else I want to say for anyone who hasn't read this or anyone who hasn't read Vonnegut, the story itself, because of the way that it does center actual events, but it's fictionalized, it carries such a weight to it that I that I was like really I mean, it feels like it feels like something beyond fiction. It feels like something beyond our typical story that we're reading. That's a yeah. fiction story because it's so there's a lot of weight with with tragedy that's happened kind of tied into this story and and uh it just, I don't know, it kind of feels like the kind of story that's just going to outlive everyone on Earth, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's at this point established canon for American literature, um, but it, it has not always been that way with Vonnegut. Um, he was a controversial figure for a long time. He was ignored uh, in literary circles. He was sort of written off as a science fiction writer, which was a pejorative term for a long time. Um, and it really, it wasn't until this novel where he sort of cemented himself as being an important writer. But even then, um, uh, there was heavy argument against it. And one of the reasons why is one of the things that I think makes him incredible is that he is writing in a way that satirizes and skewers American culture. And, 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 you know, what we believe to be uh, important as Americans, and I say we as in Americans. Um, and, And so in that way, you can imagine he, pissed off a lot of people and uh a lot of people called it trash called it you know heretical um they just did not like his writing this book in particular is uh one of the most banned books of all time it has been it has been tried to be banned from uh school curriculum school libraries um over and over again even in the last decade um there's there's schools trying to ban it from their libraries um and I, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to make a comparison to something and I don't want it to feel like reductive to what that actually represents. But, you know, in school, a lot of people read the diary of Anne Frank. Mm-hmm. And in certain ways, I feel like we're getting perspectives on the Second World War in a way that something like that is giving students perspective. And I understand that, like, there's a lot there's a lot wrapped up in this story that isn't like history in the way that Anne Frank's diary is. But it feels like of an importance level of something like that to me just because it's like while also while being fictionalized and while you know like i said swinging for the fences and doing some things that that maybe some people would find to be it's a it's a dark comedy it's a yeah. it's a black comedy and, and and it's like it has some elements of of maybe going too far for some people but this is someone who basically lived through some of this stuff so to me it feels like a like a, a diary in a sense from an artist going through something like this you won't be surprised to know that a lot of the reasons they're trying to ban it are some of the worst dumbest reasons out there yeah of course sure. um a circuit judge described the book as quote depraved immoral psychotic vulgar and anti-christian uh when he tried to ban it um ah, so yeah. that's the reason <laughs> <laughs> um 
It is also, uh, you know, it's it's uh, irreverent tone, purportedly obscene content and depictions of sex, American soldiers' use of profanity and perceived heresy. Um, it also contained the first literary acknowledgement that homosexual men were among the victims of the Holocaust, which was controversial. Used to be. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And um, the whole thing, the firebombing of Dresden, which is what this book uh, centers around, um, for the longest time was not something that Americans talked about because to talk about it in the way that he does is critical of the government and critical of the action and, and saying maybe this was a war crime. Maybe this shouldn't have happened. And that was not okay to say for a long time after the Second World War where everything the Allies did was justified in the eyes of many of the public. So you couldn't write a book like this, you know what I mean? And he happened to write it right around the time of the Vietnam War where... Uh, public sentiment was changing and people were starting to doubt the right. uh the the government and because of that it hit at this time where people were eager for this kind of book yeah i mean this is around the time of like watergate and vietnam and like all of this stuff mm -hmm. like uh, the the cultural upheaval of of the like what had been the, the status quo for a while um and I, I, you know, I was familiar with the firebombing of Dresden, but mm. but like not to this, to, you know, not how familiar I am with it now. And that is, I think, part of it was kind of a footnote in the war. And like you said, certain things were, were justified. Like, I think, you know, I don't think at this point, but I think the culture in general had sort of like justified Hiroshima and like the things that had to be done to save, you know, countless lives because it was going to continue on forever, um, the war. But uh this this sort of like you said was kind of buried not talked about and so him bringing this up uh allowed me to like i went looking into it some as well and was like I, you know it's it's not a there's there's no reason to compare tragedies but more people yeah, died in, it's not a in contest this, right and more people died in this and it's like never really talked about and, yeah uh, i i um so vonnegut does say that um i did read that the numbers he was basing that on have now been have now been modified and maybe it was okay. less now but it, like ultimately it doesn't first off it doesn't really matter right you know what i mean it's not a contest about what was it's worse. still a tragedy yeah, yeah it's, it's still thousands about. and thousands um of of civilians were were murdered and then um the other thing is they don't really know is the thing with a lot of these these estimates like the reason there is a lot of debate is like there are mass graves out there that people aren't exhuming all of them people don't even know where yeah. they all are they don't know how many people died in a lot of these events it's all just estimates so who knows yeah after i read the end of the book i went back and read the beginning again just because i felt mm -hmm. like it was so because of the way that it was seeding the whole story and um it's cutting to the bone in a way that like i think needed to be done with like in regard to like details and stuff about uh this mass this like dresden firebombing and uh it's also so i mean like we should just talk about it i think at this point is that like he he experienced it like in the war kurt vonnegut ex was there during the bombing the firebombing yes he was there this is a it is a fictionalized account about a man named billy pilgrim um but the billy pilgrim experiences real things that kurt vonnegut did experience um and if if this sounds interesting to you, I want to give a recommendation for The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. And I kept thinking about that book, um, which I'm sure this book was a huge influence for. Um, mm -hmm. That book is to Vietnam, I would argue, as, as Slaughterhouse-Five is to the Second World War. Um, except for, like, the tones are a little different. Tim O'Brien isn't as, like, satirical as Kurt Vonnegut, but... Um, it has it has some real similar vibes to it. I was just lightly looking into some stuff about Slaughterhouse Five, and I saw people also talking about um, Catch Twenty Two coming at like a a time that was like pretty relevant to the Second World War as well. And it's yep. not like the same tone or anything like that, but it's in the same way, it's kind of engaging with the war. Yeah, I see those two books likened to each other a lot. While we're right here, um, we're things that I think are in conversation with slaughterhouse five there were a lot of projects that we've actually covered yes. i'm not going to say them here but there were a lot of projects that we've covered that i'm like oh my god they're like a hundred percent in conversation with kurt vonnegut slaughterhouse five in this sort of whether it's the basis of the story or like details or i was like the influence can be seen mm -hmm. and i didn't even know uh, the, in, in some of the projects that we've covered i will mention one i don't think it's a spoiler but uh ted chang uh during his uh presentation he did that i attended in portland specifically read a quote from this novel 
um, as it relates to uh, he was doing a discussion on time travel and he was talking about the nature of time. Um, so I think Ted Chiang obviously influenced by this. Yeah. When I when I, you know, some things happen in the story and I was like, oh, my God, like the, like Ted Chiang is definitely in conversation with this. Uh, and then others that we've talked about, Douglas Adams, I would say, is in conversation with this. Um, Dr. Strangelove is in conversation with this in ways interesting um in just the the and maybe some of the tone maybe not quite as as like comical but, but i definitely think american that, american military sentiments and mm-hmm. it's got to be you know you're talking about war and you're talking about some of that stuff you're gonna you're gonna deal with some of the same concepts yeah. charlie kaufman heavily influenced by vonnegut uh talk, talks a lot about slaughterhouse five um, I mean, there's there's so many that were bouncing around in my head. I'm sure more of them will, will come to me as we go. But uh, before, it, other than just, you know, referencing connections, which is probably not super interesting to anyone other than us. But um, <laughs> I want to know before we get into spoilers and everything, um, what what was it uh, about the writing and about the the message of the book, I guess, that, that made you feel like this is one of your favorite books? Like what can you can you put any w- words to it? It's pretty tough for me, but I I, so to talk about the structure of the story is one thing right away is like the way that he framed it with the first chapter and then not having it be about himself, having it be about a fictionalized character. And then uh, just to say another connection that I was thinking about is like the way that Jesus's son that we covered was sort of like vignettes and like small stories within someone's entire existence all throughout time. that that sort of like almost anthology feel like or like because you know it's the same character so it's not an anthology but that the but small it's like little snippets, different moments in, in his life yeah i think that that structure is really really interesting and then obviously it's non-linear we're jumping all over the place mm-hmm. um I, I so just that's just structure and then the way that he thinks in his writing it feels in some some cases it feels like stream of consciousness and it's so it's so just like coming at you so rapid fire. But then you can see along the way that it's so meticulously plot. It's so meticulously laid because like as so I was thinking it of, of it as like a thread, or like someone someone weaving thread into like a piece of fabric. And then as they pull on the thread, as it gets closer to the end, it sort of like tightens down to create stitches that are all like neatly in order because it's kind of all, all, all over the place for a little while. And then things start to really fall into place. And there's a lot of ambiguity stuff that I won't give like specific details about that I loved with like um, our narrator and our main mm-hmm. character, like whether you trust some of the stuff that's going on or not. And ultimately, like 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 I said, I, I'm a sucker for like just going like balls to the wall with like the craziest stuff you could like something if going into this, I could have never fathomed where it was going to go. Yeah. And I'm a huge fan of that. And there's some sci fi elements that I was like an, caught me completely by surprise that I was like. Um, I really clicked into and then like I was talking about before just the overall weight of the story with like It feels like it feels like something that's like so meta and it's like there's mm-hmm. so much baked into it That is it's not about Any of the sci-fi elements or any of the fictionalized moments. It's it's it can also just be about like how This is such a t- uh, like a clear perspective on a takedown of like being anti-war you know what i mean Mm. this is like it's so brutal it's so dark there are moments of levity and there are moments of like irony that keep it like engaging but at the same time like i walked away just feeling like and like it i don't know it lived with me for a little while you know what i mean it just felt so heavy that is one one thing i will say about this book for sure um in my in my memory of reading his other novels and i haven't read them all but the ones i have read is they were all funnier than this book yeah this book is is perhaps his most serious that i've read now all of his books have elements of seriousness they talk they deal with heavy topics um you know he he likes to deal with that kind of stuff but this book it gets real heavy sometimes but there's still that element uh, of humor throughout that that keeps it incredibly readable I was just taken with how easy and how addicting this book was. I sat down to read this thing. I think I read it in like two or three different sittings, which for me is very unusual. I, I'm just sitting there powering through it. And I'd read this book before, but it didn't matter. Um, and it's like he gives you just like a couple paragraphs and then a, then a line break, a couple paragraphs and then a line break, a couple paragraphs and a line break. Um, and, and I read about this and he said, um, essentially mosaics made up of a whole bunch of tiny little chips and each chip is a joke. And that's the way he writes his books. And I think joke he's saying very broadly here because it feels like these little moments, he's just giving you little pieces and each little piece has a little 
beginning, middle, and end. It leads to some sort of punchline, and whether that punchline is funny or or darkly ironic or or kind of sad or just powerful, there are these little moments, and and it's broken up, and in because of that, it's so easy to read. And then his style is incredibly simple. It's concise. And I would say it's conversational. It feels like he is talking to you. He doesn't feel like he's writing a book. He doesn't feel like he is this highfalutin author mm-hmm. with with this like, you know, prose that is like, oh my God, look at the majesty. Look at how, how rich it is. No, he's just like, he's just, he's almost summarizing the novel to you. Uh, so I can't find the exact quote, but um, I can't even remember where I read it. But he said something to the effect of, he finds books to be more interesting when someone relates them to you than actually reading them. So he feels like he his career has been a process of him summarizing 50 different books so he could tell it to you without you actually having to read it. That's awesome. That's so funny. And I do think I was picking up on some of that with like the way that it feels like stream of consciousness in a way. It's not quite as like chaotic as that, but it also... Um, made it feel incredibly like fresh and like it did not feel like a novel from 1969 it felt like it could have been written like yesterday yeah i agree uh yeah it really it really holds up um you know i think this book is excellent and uh there's a lot that went into the background of writing it which uh i guess let's get into um i think uh this has our glowing recommendation from both of us it sounds like so if you haven't read slaughterhouse five if you hadn't read kurt vonnegut check it out if you have then let's talk about it some more. <laughs> so uh, Kurt Vonnegut used to go by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. I heard him explain in an interview that um, he dropped it after the other Kurt Vonnegut passed away because it was only a, a, a paperwork. He said it was a clerical decision to include the junior. Um, but it, <laughs> Was he actually a junior, though? Yeah, he was an actual okay. junior. But I guess like Got when it. his father passed away, he decided he didn't need to have it anymore. <laughs> Interesting. I assume it was his father. I don't know. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, Kurt Vonnegut uh, he is the author of 14 novels, three short story collections, five plays, five nonfiction works, and further collections being published after his death. Something that's been ruminating, by the way, since you said it, is like I can completely see Charlie Kaufman loving Kurt Vonnegut. Of it's course. like, the, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the style of like just you can never really predict where a Charlie Kaufman story is going to go in the mm-hmm. same kind of way, I think. Yeah, which, uh, uh, just because you mentioned it, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I saw that in 2013, Guillermo del Toro mentioned wanting to work on an, a, a remake of the adaptation we're going to cover for Slaughterhouse Five, featuring Charlie Kaufman as the writer. Jesus, man! Clearly, that hasn't happened. <laughs> so I don't know what happened to that project, but that sounds fucking amazing, doesn't it? <laughs> so many Guillermo del Toro projects that I would like to see. I think for a little while there, he was trying to do uh, "In the Mountain of Madness." Okay, the, yeah, Lovecraft. is that what it's called? Yeah. In the Mountains of Madness, I think it's called. He, I knew that that was one that like people were talking about for a long time, and he has like a big manuscript and tons of he put in tons of work, and like there's been artist renderings of things, and like wow. I would love to see that as well. Interesting. Uh, okay, so born and raised in Indianapolis, Vonnegut attended Cornell University, but withdrew in 1943 and enlisted in the U.S. Army. As part of his training, he studied mechanical engineering at Carnegie Institute of Technology and the University of Tennessee. On May 14th, 1944, Vonnegut returned home on leave for Mother's Day weekend to discover that his mother had committed suicide that previous night by overdosing on sleeping pills. Possible factors that contributed to Edith Vonnegut's suicide include family's loss of wealth and status, Vonnegut's forthcoming deployment overseas, and her own lack of success as a writer. Three months after his mother's suicide, Vonnegut was sent to Europe as an intelligence scout with the 106th Infantry Division. In December of 1944, he fought in the Battle of the Bulge, the final German offensive of the war. During the battle, the 106th Infantry Division, which had only recently reached the front, was assigned the, quote, quiet sector due to its inexperience and was overrun by advancing German armored forces. Over 500 members of the division were killed and over 6,000 were captured. On December 22nd, Vonnegut was captured with about 50 other American soldiers. Vonnegut was taken by boxcar to a prison camp south of Dresden in Saxony. During the journey, the Royal Air Force mistakenly attacked the trains, carrying Vonnegut and his fellow prisoners of war, killing about 150 of them. Vonnegut was sent to Dresden, the, quote, first fancy city he had ever seen. He lived in a slaughterhouse when he got to the city and worked in a factory that made malt syrup for pregnant women. Vonnegut recalled the sirens going off whenever another city was bombed. The Germans did not expect the Dresden to be bombed, Vonnegut said. Quote, 
There were very few air raid shelters in town and no war industries, just cigarette factories, hospitals, and clarinet factories. On February 13, 1945, Dresden became the target of Allied forces. In the hours and days that followed, the Allies engaged in a fierce firebombing of the city. The offensive subsided on February 15th, with around 25,000 civilians killed in the bombing. Vonnegut marveled at the level of both the destruction in Dresden and the secrecy that attended it. He had survived by taking refuge in a meat locker three stories underground. Quote, it was cool there, with cadavers hanging all around, Vonnegut said. When we came up, the city was gone. They burnt the whole damn town down. Vonnegut and other American prisoners were put to work immediately after the bombing, excavating bodies from the rubble. He described the activity as, quote, an el- terribly er- elaborate Easter egg hunt. The American POWs were evacuated on foot to the border of Saxony after U.S. General George S. Patton captured Leipzig. With the captives abandoned by their guards, Vonnegut reached a prisoner of war repatriation camp in France before the end of May 1945 with the aid of the Soviets. So that was his journey through the war, which I think is worth talking about as it relates to the novel, as we'll get into. So a lot of the events and a lot of the details in the novel are directly from his life. Right. And that's not to, you know, we've talked in the past about how, like, there is a certain amount of people saying, like, oh, the author wrote this. Is this from an experience they had? And how that might, people, some people might see that as, like, taking away from the art in some way. But I think in this scenario, it's, like, some of this is, like, stranger than fiction. You know what I mean? Some of this is, like, it's just, like, it's a story that needed to be told, I think. And he felt that. And I love the way that he, like, sort of frames that in the first chapter as well as, like, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a work in progress for a long time. He always knew that it was a story he wanted to tell as a writer. Uh, and I mentioned before, like, just uh, in the ways that I think an artist would, like, you know, I think there's an artist in everyone, but specifically in the ways that I think someone like this would have to cope with and and, and talk about and, and write a story about something like this. I think that this, um, like I mentioned before, feels like almost a perspective a la... Uh, and Frank's diary. You know what I mean? It feels mm-hmm. like someone telling you events that happened while, you know, there's some fictionalized things that happen and clearly some sci-fi elements. It, the things that are real feel like, like you mentioned the, the syrup factory, which mm-hmm. is like, it becomes a, an important detail. And it's such a random ass detail that you could never make that up. Yeah. And it makes so much sense though. Like in the, yeah. in the scene, you're like, wow, like this is of course some, like stuff was going on like this for pr- prisoners of war and what it would mean to them to find something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things you talked about was how long it took him to write this. And that is, uh, that is talked about in the opening to this book, but it is completely true. It took him, uh, I think like 20 years to write this book. He was basically working on it after the war until the time it was published in one way or another, he published a bunch of other novels in the intervening. So his first published novel was Player Piano in 1952. Uh, The novel was reviewed positively, but was not commercially successful at the time. Uh, In the nearly 20 years that followed, he published several novels that were well-regarded, two of which, The Sirens of Titan and Cat's Cradle, were nominated for the Hugo Award for Best Novel. He published a short story collection, Welcome to the Monkey House, in 1968, but his breakthrough was his commercially and critically successful novel, Slaughterhouse-Five, in 1969. The book's anti-war sentiment resonated with its readers amidst the ongoing Vietnam War, and the reviews were generally positive. Uh, After its release, Slaughterhouse-Five went to the top of the New York Times bestseller list, thrusting Vonnegut into fame. He was invited to give speeches, lectures, and commencement addresses around the country, and received many awards and honors. Um, And in fact, this is around the time he was invited to teach at the Iowa Writers' Workshop, which he has said uh, revived his writing career. He was considering giving up writing um, at the time. Um, and, and for a long time, it was it was because he he was harshly criticized. People said that he didn't know how to plot a novel, that he didn't have anything important to say. Um, he was lambasted with every new book that came out. His critics got harsher and harsher. Um, and, and really, it wasn't until Slaughterhouse-Five that people started taking note. And then, of course, you look back at a lot of those books, um, and they're now well regarded as, you know, important pieces of his oeuvre. And, and sort of up all a part of a of a body of work that is all in conversation with itself it, it you know his his whole body of work uh has these really interesting sort of moral statements uh about uh uh how to live life what's important what's not important 
um, about what's all bullshit and and um, you know what what you can do in the face of the absurdity um, of 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 life. He's an atheist. He's a humanist, um, and uh, that sort of uh, I think informs all of his work. Um, and and the way that he squares those philosophies with his humor and um, how he finds like why why go on <laughs> um, uh, and and uh, that that I think is like the question that permeates a lot of his books and he tells you like straight up like this is why and and that's one of the things I love about Vonnegut is he's not afraid to take stands and and be like you know in fact one of his quotes is like we're all here to fart around don't let anyone tell you anything different or this is from uh, the sirens of titan he says a purpose of human life no matter who is controlling it is to love whoever is around to be loved um so he makes these statements that that are profound and powerful and and sort of telling you like this is how to live uh in a way that a lot of people are afraid to do but you know i think he's able to get away with it because so much of it is ironic and self-aware and he even like is very aware of the fact that he doesn't know anything and and this is just his observation that he's making so he's not giving it with some sort of like authority he's just saying like this is what he has observed yeah and honestly like that's that's how i have to view the world as well like this is this is someone who's gone through like unspeakable tragedy and still comes out the other side like looking at the darkest parts of the world and still like ponders the comedy of it all and like how it's all inescapable and like um it does remind me a little bit of like i already mentioned him before but like douglas adams like the way that he approaches how infinitesimal people Mm. humans are and human beings and but life is important and there is like joy in it and there is you know there is a purpose but it's just about like finding it and and like creating a purpose and yeah it's uh that's what i mean with like the the, the sensibilities of this book really like hit me like a freight mm-hmm. train i was like this is perfect like i love this book i'm gonna give you another quote this is from i think a different book but he says hello babies welcome to earth it's hot in the summer and cold in the winter it's round and wet and crowded on the outside babies you've got a hundred years here there's only one rule that i know of babies god damn it you have to be kind so so that's like it's the kind of shit you know it's just like it's funny clever it's clever it's you know and and and, um one thing that i wanted to talk about that i think you'll think is cool there is tons of references in this book to other vonnegut books um there uh so the trough medorians uh appear in multiple other novels of his what that's Um, crazy uh, i thought that was just a one-off kind of thing uh they're in a bunch of his other books um uh kilgore trout is the main one of the main characters of Breakfast of Champions? The uh, author. The author, yeah. No way, that's awesome. Yeah, he and he appears in a bunch of other books. Um, multiple characters appear in other books. Um, uh, we'll, we'll get into some of the other ones. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's got this whole thing where like even more than like a Stephen King or something that we've talked about, where like the characters appear in different books. And what's funny is like sometimes they're they're like the, the same character ostensibly, but he'll change like details about like what their job is and like how old they are and what their personality's like, but they'll have the same name and they'll kind of be the same. And he doesn't ever explain it. He just is like, that's how he is in this book. So like uh, Kilgore Trout, apparently in like different books that he's in will, will often seem like a kind of a different person, but have certain core things that stay the same. Wow. So, Anyway, it's interesting, right? Um, so we got cool a whole Vonniverse von- coming, is what you're telling me. Yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> and it's like, I think you can read this book without knowing that, and it's fine. You know, it, you don't miss anything. But it's cool yeah. that if you read a bunch of his other books, you'll start to see this connective tissue yeah. and notice characters showing up at different places. I, I feel like authors know like how rewarding that can be to a reader. You know what I mean? And it kind of, it's kind of a hook sometimes. Yeah, I absolutely think that's true. Um, so one thing you mentioned was how he lived through this unspeakable tragedy. And I think that informs a lot of his books. Um, and, and that's absolutely true. I mean, I, you can't even imagine what it would have been like to live through something like this. And um, I, I think he's rendered speechless. And I think that's an important thing to remember for this book. I think that's, that's very key to him trying to tell the story of this book, why it took him so long, why he struggled so hard and why we got this book that is so weird and disjointed and, nonsensical in ways um because that's i think how he feels about the whole experience yeah we haven't spoken about like specific numbers and i don't know them but i do want people to understand like at the fire bombing of dresden nearly the entire city was destroyed yeah everyone in the city for the most part died and there were like very few survivors 
and Vonnegut and that that group of POWs and some of those other Germans and stuff being being the survivors. For yeah, the most part. you know, I'm sure there were more, but there were some more. But yeah, I mean, they, few and far between. You're, you're absolutely right, because it, it lit the air on fire. Everything burned. Um, and you know, it's, it's gross. You actually go on YouTube, you can look up the allied, they had videos like, um, that played on, I think newscasts and stuff in America and in really? Britain. Um, Probably of, honestly at the theaters and stuff. For well, like the... it was like a short, it was just like a short clip, but it was like, it was like, a, it seemed like it was a newscast where it was talking about the bombing of Dresden and it was talking about just like how great it was, how it was this awesome maneuver that the Germans never saw coming. And it was like talking about like the light show as they're watching these bombs go off and it's all like propaganda. You know what I mean? It's all, it's all America. Fuck. Yeah. You know, in, in the British too, I think the British actually were the first ones to drop the bombs, but it was, an, it was a, it was a joint attack between the two of them and um it's gross you know and 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 like it's it's really interesting um how you know as we start to get into spoilers like he talks about it later with a with a character who uh who is so like adamant about like oh you should really feel bad for the pilots you know what they had to do dropping those bombs that's who you should feel bad for and like billy pilgrim just goes yeah you know he's he doesn't argue he just goes yeah I, I agree. we're going to talk about him a yeah, lot because and, and there's there's a lot to be said. There's a lot to talk about Billy Pilgrim. Anyway, um okay, before we get into the plot, yeah, let's finish t- up talking about Kurt Vonnegut, but um another thing I saw that was uh tragic. 1958 his sister Alice died of cancer and 2 days after her husband James was killed in a train accident. So the Vonnegut's wow. took on 3 of the Adams young sons, uh James, Stephen and Kurt aged 14, 11 and 9 to raise them as their own Mm -hmm. um so so this is the kind of stuff you know he's dealing with he's you know his his sister dies i mean and and honestly i i'm thinking a little bit of what happens with billy pilgrim kurt vonnegut himself took on these children and like him and and his his wife yeah they they took on these kids to raise them as their own yeah yeah um uh i was talking about how uh he was struggling writer and for the long time he wasn't making a lot of money Um, He was widely being bashed as being, you know, a science fiction writer, which was not respectable at the time, which he thought was bullshit. Uh, He even had a quote where he said something like, uh, as if someone who knows how to how a refrigerator works can't write a decent novel, something like that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, Breakfast of Champions was was blasted by critics when it came out and it was kind of a bomb. And like, I love that. I kind of don't want to know, like, even plot synopsis or anything about any of his other stuff before I read it, just because like this this experience was really unique. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try. I'll try not to to summarize it then. Uh, (laughs) um, But yeah, I mean, we got to talk about his later in life stuff, too. Um, After Slaughterhouse Five was published and he became all of a sudden he was like famous after for many. I mean, this was when in the 70s. So or right at the start of the 70s. So. He was um, in his late 40s, nearly 50s. So, like, he was later on in his career. He already published a bunch of books and, and was struggling for a long time. And then all of a sudden, he has this fame. Um, and all of a sudden, he starts going around and doing these tours and, and um, doing all these 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 talks. Um, but meanwhile, uh, his personal life started disintegrating. Um, his wife, Jane, embraced Christianity, which contrasted Vonnegut's atheistic beliefs. Um and uh, at this point, five of their six children had left home, and the two were forced to find, quote, other sorts of seemingly important work to do. Um, the couple battled over their differing beliefs until Vonnegut moved from their Cape Cod home in 1971. So at the same time he was going through, you know, he's putting out this book, he's going through that, he ends up getting yeah. a divorce. Um, he stays friendly with his wife, um, but he just said that the, the differences were too ir- irreconcilable. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, went through a tough time. His son, Mark, suffered a mental breakdown, um, which exacerbated Vonnegut's chronic depression. Um, and he started seeing a psychologist in the mid 1970s. Um, he attempted suicide, I saw, in the 80s. Um, um, so this was he was a troubled guy. You know, he he was one of those guys who. I think um, tried to reconcile his depression through humor. You know, like someone you look at someone like Robin Williams, people like that, yeah. like who there's like a deep trauma there. I mean, clearly PTSD. 
Um, you know, when I was thinking about Billy Pilgrim is said to just like start crying all the time. And he, he, there's these moments where he goes and lays down and just starts crying for like no reason that he can put his finger on. And that just felt yeah. like such a real detail to me to someone who's been to the kind of things he's been through. Yeah. While we're here, I have to uh, read. There's sort of I, I'm not sure what you call this. Like right before the novel, there's like a little poem kind of thing. Do you know what does what that consider? Is it uh, like a, epigraph, I think? Name? epigraph okay yeah if, if it's what and I'm i think of. this very much is like obviously it's talking about billy but i think it might be talking about uh vonnegut himself as as well and it's the cattle the cattle are lowing the baby awakes but the little lord jesus no crying he makes and so of course that has to do with like soldiers and and like what they're what they're dealing with uh, and you know you could you can interpret it as anything really but and, and like his connection to religion but um and or at least Inter- lack thereof. internalized sadness and the inability to express it and yeah, yeah like he talks about how you know yeah he doesn't cry um uh often and, and often he, but when he does it's like quietly on his own yeah. like hiding it and yeah. you know he feels shame potentially there's, about there's that. there's so many great quotes that this reminds me of that i want to like quote verbatim and i'm just so bad at recalling that but like <laughs> he has a quote where he says something about like it, you know faced with you know great sadness you can either laugh or cry and he prefers yeah. the former because there's a lot less cleanup afterwards or something like that like it's again a funny quote and like that's just how he yeah. is you know i really do and, and i really do relate to that because that that is like uh, that is typically how i you know i've never dealt with anything as as unbelievably tragic as as any of the stuff he's gone through but that is like sort of my outlook as well like if you if you can't laugh at it there's nothing else to do but just like scream at the void you know what i mean there's it's scary stuff dealing with dealing with that kind of depression and stuff that i'm sure he's dealing with yeah he was a lifelong smoker um he did live until he was in his 80s he died in manhattan and uh, on the night of April 11th, 2007, as a result of it, brain injuries, incurred several weeks prior from a fall at his home. His death was reported by his wife, Jill. He was 84 years old at the time of his death. A book composed of his unpublished pieces, Armageddon and Respect, was compiled and posthumously published by his son, Mark, in 2008. One thing that I think that's also interesting, he said... Um, when it, when it relates to death, and, and I think it's you know important for this, for this series. Quote, When a person dies, he only appears to die. He is still very much alive in the past, so it is very silly for people to cry at his funeral. All moments, past, present, future, always have existed, always will exist. So, and this is what he believed. Um, so, in that sense, you know, yeah, he's, he's died, but his life is this perfect captured an amber thing that exists for all time in his in his point of view um so i i like i like thinking of that when you know i think about how sad it is that he's not around anymore um i don't know i think that i think that's a a cool way to look at it and and something that um again is it's a it's a thought that you see echoed in so many other things even like true detective has talked about this kind of stuff with the time is a flat circle kind of thoughts mm-hmm. um a lot of this i i don't know how much he originated this thinking but um, you know, this is a very early, early description of it. And that's a, a big thing in, in this book, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Okay. So that's Kurt Vonnegut. Um, so much more we could talk about. I know more things. I've watched a bunch of interviews. If it comes up, I'll talk about it, but we got to get into the actual plot of this book, which was a mess, by the way, <laughs> I looked up five different summaries who all took different attempts to like how to summarize this book to various levels of failure. Um, I found one that I think is pretty good. I'll read it in three chunks just to give us a leaping off point. Um, but again, this book is like almost impossible to summarize because of it's the just constantly going around in time and all kinds of stuff. Kurt Vonnegut wishes to write a novel about the firebombing of Dresden, which he witnessed as an American POW and survived by hiding in a slaughterhouse. Vonnegut contacts his friend Bernard O'Hare, but they cannot remember much about the bombing. They later visit Dresden and walk through the reconstructed city together. Vonnegut begins the story of Billy Pilgrim, a man who has, quote, come unstuck in time, and who was also captured at the Battle of the Bulge, taken prisoner by the Germans, and kept in a slaughterhouse during the Dresden bombings. Two narratives emerge. The first details Billy's meeting of Roland Weary, an unruly fellow soldier, their farcical capture by the Germans, transfer via railcar to a POW camp, and later transfer to Dresden, a city that appears safe from Allied bombing because it has no war industry. 
Along the way, Weary, who has sustained foot injuries from the poor shoes given to him by the Germans, dies and blames Billy. Paul Lazaro, another soldier, overhears Weary calling for vengeance against Billy and vows to kill Billy. Billy also meets Edgar Derby, a kind middle-aged soldier who cares for him in the POW camp and is later executed for stealing a teapot from the rubble of Dresden. Okay, again, this jumps all over the place. A lot of these details we find later on. Some of them are like, he, he often like foreshadows things or like even just drops spoilers like right at the start of the book. He tells yeah. you what the final line of the book is like right towards the start, like things like I that. So that. It's, yeah. all, it's all like out of order anyway. Um, but yeah. So to start us off, uh, the framing device that he used, we've talked about, he starts off sort of giving an account of how the book eventually was developed. And I have to talk about the relationship he has with Mary O'Hare because he dedicates the book one of two people that he dedicates the book to is Mary O'Hare yeah and which uh, is the wife the way- of uh, Bernard who's his friend that he went to go right. see. so he goes to visit this this fellow veteran and yeah they become friends yeah, but at the time he they're friends. hadn't talked to him yeah in a while right so he he goes and talks to him and and uh, his wife is very standoffish Mary is very standoffish and she uh, is kind of like moving around furniture while they're trying to reminisce, and there, there, there's not a lot of act like direct connection going on between Billy and and his friend. Uh, but eventually, she comes down and he confronts the situation. He's like, "What's going on?" And she basically talks about how he's just going to write like a John Wayne, uh, like sort of story that that glorifies war and and shows yeah, it in sorry, all John good Wayne life. or Frank Sinatra, yeah, right. And I think that's a great way to frame this story. And what it what it's the intention is, because those stories do exist absolutely, and yeah. people people do engage with them. Well, and she's mad about that. She's like, "That's all you're gonna do." And instead of talking about how you were all just babies, like she says over right. and over again, you were all just children. Right, and I love how that sets up because she's talking. She, they have children upstairs that are sleeping, and she's yeah. like, "You know, you're gonna glorify this thing, and then eventually these babies are gonna be forced into a war based on decision making that people are influenced into." based on your novel and that's yeah. the idea is like pro- like just sort of proliferating this out and continuing the cycle and that like sort of they he said something about how he he wouldn't write a story like that and they became friends beyond that yep um he was gonna call it the children's crusade which is like a sub it's like a alternate subtitle for this book yeah so the children's crusade in the way that it is entirely true like we've we've both seen it in our own lives especially i'm sure you and and like uh, as people a little bit older than you, like we're, we're when be, we're being drawn into war in like 2001, 2002 mm-hmm. and stuff. And uh, just that they were children, you know, they're they're 18 year old kids and they're being asked to they're very uh, impressionable and they're being yeah. asked to do things. They feel invincible. There's a reason that that's the time of your life where you're signing up for stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so and just like to sort of having that conversation and talking about like the boy the the children are having a war that the men or the the el- the elder people within society are are deciding that they're going and doing and that's really like the framing device of this story and like mm-hmm. going forward we have to think of all of these people cuz i don't know about you but because it is the 40s a lot of times i if i hear stories about world war 2 i'm always thinking of like the people who are telling the stories right they're so they're so old they're in their 80s 90s 100s and a lot of them are, are not with us any longer yeah but they were kids they were they were children mm-hmm. and they were they were being forced into these scenarios and stuff and uh the way that he frames that with Billy Pilgrim and just how innocent this character is. Yeah. Well, and unheroic. I think it's really interesting how there are almost no heroes. In the, like, there's, and there's almost no good soldiers. And good soldiers tend to die in, <laughs> when he does encounter them. Like, I'm thinking of the scouts, right? These two scouts who are, like, too good. And, like, they're like, you guys are going to get us killed. So they go off. And then, then they hear them get executed. Like, they get stuck right. up on the And that's kind of like, talked about because, like, a good soldier is, is the one that's, like, chasing glory in some ways, right? Yeah. Like, they, they want to lay down their life for, for the cause. And, like, it's really interesting how well, that's talked yeah. about as well. And, and like, the, the lack of heroism, I think, is an important theme throughout because, like, Billy is not heroic in any way. He's, like, just bumbling along through the war. Um, Weary, this Roland Weary character, is awful. Like, he, we hear about him, like, he loves torture devices. I think he, like, killed a dog, he talks about, and, like, delighted in the killing of the dog. Like, and, um, he seems awful. He's, But he saves Billy's life. Um, mm-hmm. And then Billy 
uh, you know, like gets blamed for his death, you know, probably <laughs> wrongly. Um, it's just like going to show like these are not the kinds of war heroes you are used to hearing about in this right. war. Right. Um, and it's again, it's another it's in particular World War, World war Two is viewed as this like good versus evil war. And yet this book hinges on the firebombing of Dresden that killed all these civilians and, um, you know, I think is at least widely considered to be very questionable whether or not this was a, a tactic that needed to be deployed and had any actual value um, in the war at the, at the time in which it was deployed. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, a couple different characters are introduced here. Uh, Paul Lazaro, uh, this character who overhears uh, the call for vengeance and vows to have Billy killed, which we find out he does have Billy killed <laughs> later on. <laughs> like in the fu- and it's interesting because it's in the future of when this novel was published. It's in like the seventies or something. He's and he's supposedly killed by like a laser gun, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, which I think is pretty funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the 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 implication is that he does have Billy killed um, as a result of of you know what Roland Weary says is he's dying from his gangrenous feet. I also want to talk about Kurt Vonnegut's sort of commentary he's making with Roland Weary yeah. and this this he's this character who's already envisioning all this glory that he's had with this like these two other people who don't even really like him and yeah. he's envisioning the three musketeers who did all these great things and they got all these war medals and everything like that and um you know I'm sure that there, that he encountered people like this in Absolutely. in certain times in it his life it feels like these are based on real people <laughs> right and, and like that's it's and and they talk about just how young everyone looks this this guy has like scarves over his face and stuff and he's like completely covered but once they do take his scarf off he looks like a child mm-hmm. and then there's also something to be said about like just how violent he is and how he'll lash out at even people who are you know his fellow soldiers and what we see him do to billy and the yeah, stories he's we about, get about to him, kick like, him to death i think when when they yeah. get captured he was trying to break his spine he was going to yeah. kick his spine in and yeah and it's like the germans walked up and were like shocked at how violent this person was being towards their own you know yeah. soldiers yeah and and like yeah the, the germans are just like dumbfounded by it they're like what the hell is even going on here so in the second narrative billy travels through time from his war experience to his youth to his post-war life and alien abduction He has trained as an optometrist, married the daughter of another wealthy optometrist, and become successful in business. He and Valencia, his wife, have two children, Robert and Barbara. But in the 1960s, Billy nearly dies in a plane crash in Vermont, and Valencia, coming to his aid, dies of carbon monoxide poisoning from a car wreck. After his plane crash, Billy announces he was abducted by Tralfamadorians, small, one-eyed, one-handed, aliens with a peculiar philosophy of time. Trophimadorians claim to see all events, past, present, and future, at the same time. This four-dimensional view of the universe informs their feelings on life, death, and fate, and Billy begins espousing these ideas publicly. He later becomes a famed orator in the 1970s and is killed by a henchman dispatched by Lazaro, just as Lazaro vowed in the war. So we took, we touched on that already. Um, <laughs> it's it's bouncing around all over the place, but that's kind of how the book is too. So yeah. Um, but yeah, the Trophimadorians, I think, are you know int- introduced here, and they're 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 saying so it goes becomes a, a refrain that gets repeated. I, I saw it was 106 times in the novel. Uh, the the refrain appears, and it it becomes this thing that happens every time. It, basically, there's any mention of death. So yep. it goes, gets tacked on because that's how the Trophimadorians view death. But uh, I wanted to, to 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 explain the saying. So it goes, um, and that comes from this quote from this is from the from the novel. When a Trophimadorian sees a corpse, all he thinks is that the dead person is in a bad condition in that particular moment, but that the same person is just fine in plenty of other moments. Now, when I myself hear that somebody is dead, I simply shrug and say what the Trophimadorians say about dead people, which is, so it goes. So, and, and that's, and the I there, I think is Kurt Vonnegut. Like he's switching to like the narrator thing. So like, this is his sort of uh, uh, philosophy. And I think I even read that he first started thinking about the Trophimadorians when he was like 10 years old. 
Like he, wow. he basically invented them as this this race. Yeah. So this is something that has been around in his writing and his beliefs for a long time. I wonder if he I wonder if he was grappling with the idea of free will when he was ten years old. When he <laughs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so uh, it is a philosophy that you could almost live your life by, right? Like yeah, it, it, there is no other way to the only. I mean, I guess I, you you could. It's kind of like, fatalistic, you could say. It's kind of like it's kind of it's it's very resigned. I, I guess I wanted to ask you what you thought. Where, where do you think Kurt Vonnegut lands as well? Do you think that he's an optimist or do you think that he's like an eternal pessimist? Like, do you think that with, with and so it goes with a lot of these things, like how does that land for you? He, he had a great interview that I watched where he talked about this. And um, for a long time, he considered himself a pessimist. And then when he got into his fifties, he changed and he said he no longer considers himself a pessimist. And um, one of the reasons is he talks about, uh, and it's interesting because it's kind of um, the the philosophy that people talk about a lot today with mindfulness. It sounds like he was kind of uh, embracing that. Um, he says, uh, I urge you to please notice when you are happy and exclaim or murmur or think at some point, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. Um, and that's how he started to like live his life. It's just like appreciate good moments Mm -hmm. like embrace them appreciate being happy and look at them for what they are and when he started embracing the happiness of the moment and like how he felt like he actually had a good life and at least was filled with good happy moments um Mm -hmm. that changed him from being this pessimist into being whatever he was then i don't know if you call it an optimist but someone who wasn't necessarily uh as as uh I don't know, depressed all the time, although he did commit, tried to commit suicide at one point. So yeah, yeah, it, like anybody, I'm sure it was complicated and I'm sure it varied based off of brain chemicals and all sorts of things going on. Yeah. So I, I guess I, part of me sees the, and so it goes as of course, like so bleak, but at the same time, like I, I like you say, it's, it, I think it's, it's one thing to say it and another thing to live it. Right. So like when you say, you know, embrace the moments and everything like that. Of course, everybody w- hopes they can do that, but actually doing it is a different sort of moment. But and and like I feel like for me, seeing it so it goes was sort of this acceptance in the way that there really is no other option. From like that 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 is kind of how I see it. Like it, it's all it's always going to happen. Like it's the it's the end it's the end for everyone at some point or another. And of course, it's going to be tragic. And of course, there there will be times that you can't sort of see any sort of silver lining or anything like that. But and so it goes means like it is going to happen. And like you just have to you just have to like sort of hope that you've made the the best of the moments that you could up until then. And like it, it is so I, I think that's part of the reason why I look at the book in, in a different way is like there's a lot of like mental health sp- specifics within the story like you can see that like billy's obviously struggling with things that maybe kurt vonnegut was as well and uh and so it goes being like a philosophy i don't know you know yeah. like you say it's, it is kind of fatalistic but well and it, it it is sort of saying like we all die some way this is how these beings whichever he's describing in this moment this is how they happen to die Maybe it's the most tragic thing you've ever heard. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's just like they passed away in a you know normal way. Whatever it is, um, or or less tragic way, it's like so it goes. We all die at some point, and if you can embrace the Trophimadorians' view of life in that like they are always alive in the previous moments, then it's not as tragic, and it kind of takes away some of that some of that awfulness from the death yeah. moment. And it does. It does kind of remind me of legacy, right? Like what you leave behind can can outlive you in that way, and you can live on through through things like that, uh, like works of art and things like that. Yeah. Um, of course, this this with the fact that I saw Arrival and read Ted Chang's story, Story of Your Life, before reading this, it was absolutely in conversation, right? Like mm-hmm. that's the same kind of idea, like seeing all of all of life all at once. Um, and the way yeah. that the cephalopods in that story interact with everything uh, well, yeah. and the idea of free will, too. Yeah. I mean, and, and Billy Pilgrim talks to the Tralfamadorians about it and he says, like, what you know, what about free will? And they they like laugh at him and they're like, we've been to like 31 different, 
intelligent, you know, planets with intelligent life and Earth is the only one where anybody ever talks about free will. It's like a, yeah. essentially a human thing <laughs> where we're like, we're the only ones who, who want to believe in free will. Yeah. Um, they don't even like understand the question. They're like, you know, there is no why. I think they literally even say mm-hmm. at one point, it's like, you know, there are no reasons for anything. It's, you know, everything's faded. And um, of course, that's like something that lots of writers want to talk about and, and engage with in different ways and try and give slightly different takes on. And, you know, I find endlessly fascinating for sure. It was really funny. It, it, like it, that, so a human interacting with an alien in that way felt very Douglas Adams to me yeah. as well with like the aliens being like, yeah, no, no. I mean, we're well beyond that. 31 of 32 have yeah. basically said that it's it's meaningless yeah or or at least that like you know there there is no free will i, I find that hilarious especially because as a human i'm going to continue to struggle with the idea of free will as well, yeah exactly you know? right and he knows that i think that's one of the things and so it goes i think uh is also like that like it's the the human beings reading this novel don't view time that way right and so we can't quite fully embrace that and so the like that that tragedy exists in the space between like where how we perceive time and how they do um, and how Billy's, I think, trying to. Of course, you can take all of this as like a metaphor for PTSD and like how to how to deal with, you know, tragic experiences and how to come to grips with things. And, you know, you can be like, what's the true story here? Is Billy Pilgrim actually unstuck in time or is this all a metaphor for like the way that, you know, when you're later in life, moments can bring you right back? you know like well, trauma as moment. well yeah. trauma it can bring you right back to those traumatic moments and like mm-hmm. you can be you know a 50 year old optometrist and all of a sudden like snap of fingers you're right back in dresden like people talk about that phenomenon mm-hmm. um and he's making that real here right like billy is actually traveling through his own life right um and of course brings up psychedelics for me as well like the idea <laughs> of of like uh, like a shift in perspective in a way like this that that billy has yeah and, and everyone else isn't necessarily able to keep up and he's and you know it's to an extreme degree it's not the same kind of thing but Com- completely uh, unrelated but like i, I kind of would love to have this power i i know that there would be a lot of sa- like being able to travel forward in time would fuck you up pretty bad but like i would love to be able to just go back and relive different moments in my back life. And forth, yeah yeah just like go back and of course like there are terrible moments you don't want to relive and you you'd probably have to relive those too because he doesn't seem to have any control over it it just happens is it voluntary or involuntary because <laughs> that's a big deciding <laughs> yeah. factor of whether i would accept that or not <laughs> <laughs> yeah i totally agree um anyway uh Okay, let's uh, let's read. I'll read the last ch- section here, and then we could just kind of talk about whatever. Um, there's, yeah, I feel like we're glossing over so much, but there's just we can't talk about everything. So while convalescing during a mental breakdown in his last year of optometry school, just after the war, Billy meets Elliot Rosewater, a fellow patient who introduces him to the science fiction of Kilgore Trout. These books present many radical ideas about the future, time, Jesus, and history, some of which are repeated by the Trout Midorians and by Vonnegut himself. During another hospital stay, this time after his plane crash, Billy meets Rumford, a historian and professor who is putting together a book on World War II, but has trouble believing that Billy was really present during the firebombing of Dresden. A barbershop quartet at Billy's 18th wedding anniversary party reminds him of the four German soldiers who stayed with the Americans in Slaughterhouse-Five. Shortly after the war ends, Billy is shipped back to America. But before he goes, Billy and other POWs take turns digging out and later incinerating bodies in the rubble, including the body of Edgar Derby. Vonnegut and O'Hare were also present, and in relating this story, Vonnegut has managed to recall details from the war and satisfy the novel's initial aim to describe the horrors of Dresden bombings and the war of war generally. Okay, so again, kind of a weird summary, but that is essentially what happens at the end here. (laughs) Um, Let's talk about Kilgore Trout, because he's a really interesting character. He is the science fiction author who is widely published but not widely read. He doesn't have mm-hmm. any money. He's like super poor. When he when he has never met like a fan before <laughs> until um until until Billy meets him later in life. Um and he's this he's this like really interesting figure. Um what did you think of Kilgore Trout? I mean, it was so interesting because a lot of a lot of people hadn't heard of him. Most people hadn't heard of him. And right. then he's, that's why he's surprised when when a fan eventually comes along. Um we got to talk about an author writing about an author. There's got to be some sort of like insert in some way or like some sort of commentary on 
the the act of writing and and like having that be your life's goal uh it's also it's interesting to me that in some ways billy's story could also be seen as an interpretation of some of the things from from Trout's sto- Trout, Trout's published work. Yep. There's this idea of like an abduction. I think it's giving fuel to the to the idea of you want to try and think of it of like is is the Trout Midorian stuff real or is this just his yeah. way of like synthesizing what he read and and you know mm-hmm. he had the brain injury in the in the plane crash and even though he says he was unstuck in time before that right. is this actually a result of of that and he's his perception of time has been I mean like up, there's know? plenty there to leave it ambiguous which right. is uh, like it, it's just there like there's the the trauma from the war the the plane crash and then all of the trout works like all blended together but it is interesting because he is friends with trout is he imagining that as well or or you see you know it's all very it's all very ambiguous which i appreciate because yeah. it, it leaves it open i i like the interpretation that you can leave it, you can read it either way you know right. what i mean it doesn't matter because ultimately the story plays out the same yeah well and it's so absurd right like the trop medorians take him to their planet and they put him in a zoo with this other right. like m- like a uh, uh, supermodel actress supermodel yeah. who was abducted and they like, are like forced to mate and all this stuff like yeah um it's consensual he, supposedly but like it's weird right and it feels like a like it feels like a very um 1940s 1950s sci-fi plot honestly you know and and um it, so it feels like something kilgore trout would write and i think that's by design um so yeah you're touching on some true things about kilgore trout he um he is actually based off of one of Kurt Vonnegut's friends. Um, he didn't he didn't admit it for a long time, but apparently because he, he thought it would be embarrassing. But after the guy died, who it's based off of, he admitted that he based it off of this this guy he knew who was, you know, uh, he wrote many, many sci fi novels that were not well read. He didn't have any success. Um, and, you know, apparently Vonnegut, you know, decided that he was going to base Kilgore Trout off of him. But you're absolutely right, because he is also sort of a self-insert character for Vonnegut himself, who often felt like he was this genre writer who wasn't appreciated and, and like we've talked about, struggled to find an audience for a while um, and, and was lambasted by critics. Um, and so, yeah, he's absolutely sort of that too, which is interesting because he's existing in a novel where Vonnegut is himself a narrator in the novel who says like some, like there are moments where Billy Pilgrim will like hear somebody say something behind him and then the narrator says, it was I who said that, <laughs> you know, like it was me. Then the, the, the author of this book. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which was just endlessly funny to me. And yeah. really, you know, just like story breaking in a way, but yeah. just enough to where I loved it. Um, yeah. And so another thing that this story sort of talks about because it was gearing up and, and sort of happening at the same time is the war in Vietnam and how, you know, the second world war was it was supposed to be the end of this sort of conflict and everything like that and then we started to get vietnam where um where it's a situation where soldiers are being sent away there's a draft instated like a lot of these mm. uh, you know children are back in war again uh yeah. the children's what's it called the children's what the children's crusade, crusade yeah again it started and, up um, again yeah how inevitable that feels within within like the human condition and how eventually like and i think the story ultimately kind of lands on humans are inherently good but there are some who will ultimately push to war and and how war will eventually happen again or or at least violence and uh yeah i mean i don't know if i agree that it, it that humans are inherently good but um, yeah you I, don't think so i i don't I th- know if... well, well let's say that this way not maybe necessarily inherently good but there is good in humans but there can you know be I mean? <laughs> there can be good in humans but yeah. ultimately like the nature is to eventually lead back to conflict in that way yeah yeah i don't know man i mean the the trying to pin down what the themes are of this book is so hard, right? Like they're so shifting and and mm-hmm. difficult to pin down, and and a lot of it is about just like the absurdity and the tragedy and um how it is repeating itself. History is repeating itself. It's happening again. And, and like he's not even saying like in the book like you know we should never go to war. There's never a good reason to go to war. He never says something like that, right? And in fact, he kind of says like, yeah, it's going to happen. Like there's always going to be wars, and there's always going to be reasons to have them. Um, but yet he still like the entire book is about how tragic and awful it is. 
So it, 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 you do get trapped in this kind of inescapable feeling of like, it's always going to happen and it's, it's fucking awful. Right. And I do think part of the, the cycle is that people forget, right? Like a generation will go through a war and then be sort of like, well, we don't want to experience that situation again. And then a few generations go by and then ultimately like it's their situ the, like people will again send the children to war and, and how that like it, the cycle is kind of endless and in, yeah. on, in unfortunate ways, at least in terms of, you know, how history sees it. Yeah. And, and one thing I want to talk about that is kind of a kind of a writer thing, but I think is really interesting is this is another example of an author breaking a rule mm -hmm. in that Billy Pilgrim the protagonist of this novel has almost no agency in this book, in this story. Mm -hmm. He, he seems to choose almost nothing. He's, he's literally dragged along by other characters. He's just present for like almost everything in his life. Um, he makes almost no choices. Um, and in fact, one of the moments where I was sort of cheering for him most is when he decides to speak up and sort of, call bullshit on this on this Rumfeld or whatever his name was guy about Dresden and he decides to be like I was actually there and yeah, he's like no. oh no you're just echoing me and he's like no I'm not <laughs> essentially like right. he chooses to like talk and like that's one of the only times where Billy Pilgrim actually does something where I was like happy for him the the book had conditioned me at that point to think that he wasn't gonna sort of he wasn't going to relay the information. He was going to yeah. just like sort of slide back into like, oh, maybe yeah. he's in a coma. Or, and ultimately or he doesn't even argue with him though is what's kind of like he goes right yeah. back into it. Like the guy says all this stuff about how, yeah, you got to, you should really, you should really pity the pilots who had to drop the bombs. And he's like, yeah, you're right. You know, like he just doesn't argue with him. <laughs> he just kind of goes along with it. And that's just how Billy yeah. Pilgrim is. He just. So what's the, what do you think the intention is there? Like, do you think that the intention was to make a character that was just solely a, an audience surrogate or was he no i i think i think it's to show how the idea of a, of a and this is just my interpretation the idea of a of a person going to war to chase heroism and to chase valor and and accomplish something and to fight for you know a, a reason and to and to it's all bullshit like in his opinion, everybody who's there is just swept up in something that is so much bigger than them that they have no control over. People die for reasons that are absurd and and pointless, um, and he's repeatedly showing that. Um, it's all just absurd, and so you have this character who, who has no power. He's just there, and I'm sure that's how Vonnegut felt, you know, like— he was a prisoner of war, like he was in these train cars that were getting bombed by his own side. A bunch of people died. He just happened to not be one of them. You know what I mean? Like all these times where people are dying around him, he just happened to not be one of them. And I'm sure he just felt like it's dumb luck. There's no reason. Um, and and I think that's why Billy Pilgrim has no power in this book, because that I think reflects how Vonnegut must feel about his whole time in the war is that he was powerless. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I guess we're arriving at the end here. I, there's so many different moments. Like there's this moment where he's talking about watching this movie in reverse and, yeah. uh, it, how like the bombs are getting sucked up and fires are getting put out and then the planes are landing. And, um, what was it like the, the, the bombs get shipped back to, to America where they're dismantled. Yeah. And then well, there's like anti-aircraft guns that are like sort of like repairing the planes. The planes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're pulling like fire from the planes and stuff. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that part up. Yeah. And then, and then, and then, uh, the, the, these people come and they get all the pieces of the bomb bombs that they've dismantled and they go into the earth and hide them in places where they'll never be used to harm anyone ever again. Like I yeah. love, like the idea of watching the movie in, re in reverse was just so cool. And like, it's mm -hmm. like, that's the way the story should be right but it's instead it's the opposite of that so um it, it, like these little all these little moments are just throughout the book there's just so many of them like too numerous to even talk about um very very cool so i did want to ask you here at the end and i have my own theories about it but i wanted to get your thoughts on it the book ends with a bird saying po t wheat uh, uh -huh. you know weird bird noise i guess <laughs> um, and it's, it's literally says one bird said to Billy Pilgrim, Poti wheat. And like he says early in the book that that's how the book's going to end. Right. So he, like calls his shot and then it ends that way. Why does the book end that way? <laughs> so at one point there is a, there's something that's said, honestly, I, and I think it's somewhere around the time that like the bombings and things are talking, talked about. And it talks about how like the landscape was changed and it turned into the surface of the moon and mm -hmm. everything was completely different forever, except for the birds. 
and how like the birds started chirping again like quickly mm-hmm. and that's the only connection i can draw to like what he was maybe trying to say with the idea of like bringing it up early on and then having the end the book end with the chirping is that like once every the landscape of everything has changed there is sort of a like like it's still go- like the birds will sh- still chirp and 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 I, I don't know necessarily what to draw from that if it's optimistic or not but yeah. it did kind of feel like an opportunity to to let the audience like breathe a sigh of relief and say like at the end of the day maybe the maybe the birds will chirp but i don't know that's okay. maybe so just almost what like I was a moment of it. optimism in the like nature sort of yeah. coming back it's interesting um it could be that i i, I also took it to be that Vonnegut has been struggling to put any of this into words. Mm-hmm. And at the end, a bird is saying something that is nonsense, right? Like it's, right. it's complete Not nonsense. Not even a bird noise, sound. Really. And it's a yeah. question, which I think is really interesting. Like it's, yeah. it's posed as a question. Like the bird is asking a question that Billy Pilgrim doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. And I think the ending with a question that you can't interpret, don't understand, and can't respond to um, I think feels appropriate for this for like what what does any of this mean and yeah. and beyond that like what even is the right question to ask which like of mm-hmm. course we're touching on some Douglas Adams there like if you don't even know that understand the question then how can you answer it and uh, 42 yeah exactly 42 <laughs> uh, to me yeah it's 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 all of this is absurd and and you can't put it into words and so uh, you just end on sort of a nonsense sound Um so yeah, that's how I took it, and I think it is interesting that it's a question, right? Like, uh, like the bird mm-hmm. is asking Billy something, but he doesn't know what it is. Yeah, um, there was a moment where uh, something I, I think it was German or some something that was in English was was complete. We got a whole paragraph, yeah, something that wasn't in English, just not translated in any way, and I kind mm-hmm. of appreciated that a lot to just know that like maybe there's a German reader or whatever language it was that that did interpret it and know what was being said, but we didn't, and Billy didn't. Uh, and that kind of fun, it's just fun as it just to play with the the, the form of a novel. In yeah, that way. we talked about that with like Cormac McCarthy had some Sp- like untranslated Spanish in uh, mm-hmm. No Country for Old Men. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, device to use. And maybe and that's a similar situation with the birds. Like we just you know it's maybe and and it's the same thing as not being able to interpret what the aliens that yeah. Uh, Trophimodorians? Yeah, I, maybe. Yeah, Trophimodorians. <laughs> they, uh, what they were saying is was kind of, we we couldn't as humans interpret that and kind of engage with that. Yeah, I like that. I like, I like that connection. Um, so yeah, I mean, we got to end now. But like, I I just love this book so much and loved Kurt yeah. Vonnegut. I would love. We should try to cover another one. I I know there is a Breakfast of Champions adaptation that is not well regarded, but maybe we should get into it just so we can read the book. Um, yeah, because it's it's a really good one. Um, a lot of fun. Now this movie that we're going to talk about next week, I'm so interested to watch. Apparently, Kurt <laughs> Vonnegut really likes it really likes wow. this movie um and wow. it was critically acclaimed even though it wasn't watched by very many people um mm-hmm. so i'm really curious to see how it holds up especially after reading this like coming fresh off of the novel um i i am absolutely excited for that um if you enjoyed our coverage of kurt vonnegut and slaughterhouse five please let us know in the form of a rating and review on whatever app you use to listen to us um we love to see them get our numbers boosted up especially if you're on itunes I, we've been hovering at like around 80 reviews for a long time i would love to get to 100 um so yeah. help us get there yeah and make sure to follow us on social media we're on facebook twitter and instagram all of those at ink to film And if you would like to support this podcast in another way, we do have a Patreon and we have monthly episodes that we release on there. Those From the Vault episodes are a taste of the kind of thing we're doing over there. We just released one on the most recent uh, Murder Murder on the Orient Express adaptation, um, talking about that. So check that out. We have a bunch of different tiers and we'd love to have your support. And thank you to Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. All right, so I mean, there's only like one last thing to to do, I think, and that's to say that everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. Um, (laughs) And until next time, keep adapting.